everyone. Thank you, Christine, for the introduction. I'm Georgia. It is such a pleasure to be here, and also a little bit hard after Frank's fantastic talk, but let's see what I can do. So today, I'm going to talk about data. How original, right? <laughs> but I will not talk about technology. I'll definitely not talk about big data. I will talk about human touch in data, handcrafted and even imperfect data instead, serendipity and data, and definitely about small data. And as a matter of fact, I will also talk about postcards, data postcards, but later. In my day job, I work as a professional in the data world. I design charts, data visualization, and interfaces that let people access data in a visual way. And I run a design firm, Accurate, and that I co-founded five years ago. We are a team of designers, data analysts, and software developers, and we work across different industries designing and developing different kinds of data-driven digital products for businesses and communication purposes. And in my profession, I realized that a common approach, a very, very common approach when it comes to data is to throw technology at the problem to begin with, sometimes without even spending enough time framing the real issue and the real challenge. We have big data, we should use Hadoop or Spark or whatever, which are only instruments. And over the last years, a lot have been done in research around what technology can bring to data, and this is amazing. But I believe that it is the true convergence and hybridization of science and design that can open new perspective and take the conversation um, to the next level. Because when we work with information, it is so easy to get fascinated by the quantities, the variables, the numbers. It's so easy to lose track of what numbers really mean and what it's important to display. With my company, we work with businesses and organizations of different nature, and for them, we do build software, custom analytic platform, and we do experiment and work with different kind of technologies indeed, but we also try every time to look at any of their data problem using a design approach from the very early stage. A design approach to actually limit the possibilities to increase the opportunities to focus on framing the right questions and ultimately to reconnect numbers to what they stand for, people, behavior. And today I'm going to share with you two completely different experiences where self-imposed constraints in a way change my relationship with data and change the lenses that I use to look at the data world. The first one is called Friends in Space. Last year, a very peculiar challenge was posed to my team by this woman, Samantha Cristoforetti. She has been the first Italian woman astronaut, and as you might have guessed already, I'm Italian, by the way. So she contacted us before being launched on a six-month-long expedition to the International Space Station, and she asked us if we wanted to collaborate on some real-time data visualization while she would be in space. How awesome! how much data there will be to visualize, like the orbits around her, the speed and position of the ISS, also uh, her Twitter feed visualized and map um, on a map on a real time, and I could really go on hours to list all of the data because the ISS makes all of this information available for everyone. A technology-driven approach would have taken us far from anything meaningful. This is exactly what we didn't want to do, and actually, who needs this? But still, we are also compelled to use all of the numbers that we have to show the complexity and the power of our engines and to display everything that we analyzed and processed all together more and more. Well, but in the end, what we wanted to achieve was a way to make feel her present, a way to remind people back here on Earth that orbiting around Earth up there, there was a human being trying to find a way to talk to them. So we decided to frame just one question to guide our design process. Is it possible to use this data to promote very simple and basic interaction and human connection? And the idea was there already. In fact, the core idea of Friends in Space, which we like to describe as the first social network that extends beyond Earth, is very simple. You log in with your social profile, you can see Samantha's real-time position above your head within the trajectory of her current orbit, which is the yellow arc, as well as a map of all of the people around the world that are online in the platform in that moment. You click hello from where you are, and a simple arc on the map connects you to other people who just said hello from all over the world. 
And every now and then you also had the possibility to say hello to Samantha when you were in her orbit, so when she was about to fly above you. So through this simple interaction, you connected with strangers you wouldn't have met otherwise. And the whole simple idea is that you are part of a map of the world that is linking different people who are feeling the same emotion, who are virtually looking at the sky and at Samantha together. And where if you were lucky, you also saw and received a feedback when Samantha was digitally waving back from the ISS. And all of these connections have been recorded for you in your control room in form of beautiful images like visual souvenirs from space. And you see that data powers all of this, but in fact, a very simple and human way of connecting drives all of the experience. And we limited the interaction by design because we wanted to play with the simplicity of the gesture of saying hello, waving and saying hello from where you are to other places on Earth and beyond Earth. And through Friends in Space, tens of thousands of people connected with Samantha and between themselves, and the whole experience and the incredibly positive response of its user taught me a very important lesson. That limitation with data are the true way to transform the abstract and the uncountable into something that can be seen, felt, and reconnected to our lives. The other experience that I want to share with you today is definitely more radical in this sense, and for me, it was the big data hangover relief. It is a zero technological, year-long personal project, a very laborious and time-consuming one that took out practically all of my evenings and weekends for the last year. It was a collaboration with information designer Stephanie Pozovic. So I am an Italian and I live in New York. Stephanie is American and she lives in London and we only met a few times in our life. But last year we decided to work together because we discovered that we have so many personal and work similarities. We are at the exact same age, both in our 30s, both only children struggling to have decided to live far away from our family. We both work with data in a very handcrafted way, trying to add a human touch to the world of computing and algorithm. And most of all, we are both obsessed with drawing with data, with sketching data. So we de decided to challenge ourselves. We would get to know each other through our data and through our drawings with data, of course. So we conceived and started what we call Dear Data, an uncommon kind of correspondence of hand-drawn data postcards, so yes, again, postcards, across the ocean. Every week since September, 14, since September 1st, 2014, and for a year, we would collect our personal data around a shared topic, from our complaints to the interaction with our partners, from the compliments we receive to the sound of our surroundings, from our negative thoughts or our habits if they show up for the week. 52 pretexts in form of data to reveal and investigate a particular aspect of ourself and about our days. At the end of the week, we would then take the time to analyze our information and to create a hand-drawn data correspondence to each other. Unfolded data postcards we will send from New York to London and to London to New York. Eventually, the postcards arrived at the other person's address with all of the scuff marks of its journey over the ocean. And we purposely designed initial constraint for the postcards to form a consistent collection, but also to allow us to experiment more with our weekly data. In fact, the front of the postcard contains no text at all. It's just hopefully a beautiful drawing that you could take as an illustration if you didn't know that there are data behind. And the back of the postcard contains the address of the other person, of course, the title of the weekend of the project, and the legend, how to interpret our drawings. And we didn't send each other any digital scan of our postcard, so we both have been eagerly waiting to get the data weekly portrayed of the other person um, in the mailbox for a year. Also, we're discovering the pleasure of checking the postbox as you get home, as Frank knows better, of course. It has been a type of slow data, small data, and incredibly analog data transmission. Well, yeah, in, in during a time when everybody talks about big data and virtual reality, we of course do small data and physical postcards, you know? Well, it doesn't sound very revolutionary, but by removing technology from the equation, we have been forced to extend ourselves as designers. On the one hand, we have been each forced to invent 52 different visual languages because hand-drawing data leads you to design that are incredibly customized and tailored to the data that you're working with. 
But removing computer from the equation also triggered us to find different ways to look at data as excuses to tell something about ourselves. In fact, as we gathered our weekly data, our process was definitely more labor intensive than just deriving standard metric from technological devices. We conceived Dear Data from the beginning as a personal documentary more than a quantified self project. In fact, we here didn't only quantify a number, we've been adding anecdotal and qualitative details in form of data to our data collection. For example, the very first week of Dear Data, we chose a pretty cold and impersonal topic. How many times do we check the time in a week? And so here is the front of my postcards, and you can see that every little symbol represents all of the times that I check the time, order per days and per hour chronologically. Nothing really complicated here. But you also see that I added anecdotal details about those moments. In fact, the different instances of my symbols indicate why I was checking the time. Was, what was I doing? Was I bored? Was I hungry? Was I late? Did I check in on purpose or just casually glance at the clock? And this is the key part, giving Stephanie an idea of my days through the pretext of my data collection, something that is not possible if we don't actually, actually actively attract, mm, add meaning to our tracking. But we can find data even in our minds and in the words we use, for example, and not only in our activities, which is even more compelling if the goal is telling you something about yourself through your data. At week seven, we tracked our complaints, and I composed these musical complaint cards borrowing a very literal visual inspiration from the music notation system to show the repetitiveness of my complaints of different types over time and their pitch, their loudness, through the positioning of my complaint notes over the line of each score. Did I truly need to complain? Explaining in my legend to Stephanie how to interpret my protest and being very honest about how grumpy I've been in the true spirit of a sharing. But we also figure that we can find data even beyond the daily tracking and, for example, make a survey of what we own walking to our closets with the eyes of the data collector and looking for data in the way we categorize and classify our garments. Or we can try to use data to become better human beings at least for a week and perform acts to then be able to report them. Like this week where we purposely smile to strangers and track their reaction, if they smile back or if they pretended they didn't notice our smile. So I'm not going to show you all of 100 104 postcards, you can find them online if you're interested, and a book is going to be published in the fall as well. But what I wanted to say is that over a year, Stephanie and I shared everything about ourselves through the excuses of our data. We truly became friends through our data. And more importantly, we both um, started to look at data, even in our professions, through different lenses. So I'm not suggesting you to start drawing your data or to find a temple across the ocean. Or actually, if you want to do it, now we have an open section on our website where you can find a data pimple, and it's already full of individuals and teachers with their students who are participating from all over the world. But anyway, it is of course not imaginable that we haul hand-draw data in our job. But experimentations of this kind, where we radically limit ourselves, where we drastically limit our tools and our possibility, can teach us a lot about the perspective that we look at any kind of data from. Because by shifting away the focus from the technology, you can get closer to real meaning. If you think about it, even when we work with big data, the whole point is making it more meaningful, more contextual. It's all about making it smaller, smarter, understandable. So for sure, data is not only a matter of technology. It's mostly a matter of how we collect, process, and relate with information. It's a matter of how we design the way we look at data. And this is why I would say we should try to shift from this data-driven design, which is pretty common to hear, but somehow implies that numbers should dictate how we approach a design problem, and that design should fit within precise boundaries that are defined by data. To something that looks more like this, design-driven data, which means we should design the ways we approach, handle, use, analyze, and talk about data, keeping always in mind that we have to translate how our numbers into human terms. And the real power of a design approach is to give us the tools, and not necessarily the technological tools, and the format to reconnect numbers to what they stand for, because ultimately it's going to be us, human, that will interact with data. When we think about data, we always associate it with more efficiency, more automation in our life. 
And if I can leave you with one thing today, is that I argue we can absolutely use data to become more human, to connect with ourselves and with others at a deeper level, if we design the right ways to do it. Thank you. <laughs>